Hi, I'm Jared Hillam. Over the last few years, we've seen a massive uptick in leveraging the Elastic Cloud for data management. This has propelled companies like Snowflake from a no-name to a $12 billion leader overnight. This amazing new reach in compute and storage capacity has rewritten the rules for where logic should live and the type of projects we can do. If you recall from my previous video titled, Where Should Logic Live?, there needs to be some deep thought about how to order logic so we're not wasting people's time or wasting compute resources. However, before I go much further, for you to understand the significance of the technical shift, I have to explain how querying of data occurs in cloud databases like Snowflake. The storage layer in these databases is unlike anything you've ever seen in the past. So just take everything you know about databases and set it aside while watching this part. Snowflake controls an immutable storage layer in your cloud vendor of choice, whether it's Google Storage, Azure Blob, or Amazon S3. As a side note, the cost of storing data in these layers hovers around $23 per terabyte per month, so a meaningless amount. Snowflake controls this layer to break up the data partitioning into tiny segments of data called micropartitions. Connected to these micropartitions is a metadata framework of pointers which can organize, stack, and optimize everything for querying. And it appears just like any other SQL database querying interface. Now, when querying occurs, Snowflake leverages native compute from your cloud host of choice. However, rather than spinning up cold machines, Snowflake keeps a hot pool of compute available for its entire customer base, which is managed by an artificial intelligence to ensure there's enough to go around. Now, unlike most databases, Snowflake is meant to be turned off when you're not using it, which is what makes their cost of use so efficient. However, when you do need access to compute, the hot pool makes it possible to instantly turn it on when you run a query. The compute simply executes the metadata pointers when it's turned on, and it provisions so fast that you probably won't notice the difference in performance whether it's off or on. These two separate layers of storage and compute are completely independent from each other. What this means is that the compute of data can scale without impacting storage and vice versa. Additionally, they have no impact on each other's availability. In other words, I can load data while users are querying it and I can scale compute at any time, even in the middle of a query. Additionally, the metadata pointers allow the data to be copied without actually duplicating the data footprint, because a clone is just copying the metadata, and the new copy happens instantly, no more waiting for copies of data. The moment that copy of pointers is made, those pointers act completely independently from the original metadata pointers. On the front end, this simply appears as a new database instance, but on the back end, the data hasn't duplicated at all. Only the metadata has been copied into a new instance with its own life. Data can be deleted and changed without impacting the original copy in any way. What this means is that the hassle of creating test and development backup copies of data is gone. Now you can do testing on the same data production is pointing to with no impact to production's performance or logic. So with that crash course out of the way, we can start talking about this future architecture more specifically. In the next few videos, I'm going to spend some time outlining some architectural principles that align to this new world of unlimited storage and compute. This architecture is going to have five main points that I'm going to bring into focus across three videos, namely source streaming, the landing zone, the data lake, data islands, and data warehousing. Now, because we get a little more in the weeds here, these next three videos are not ones that I'm going to give out without a registration page. If you'd like to register for the first video, click on the link in the video description, and I'll catch you on the other side.